Once upon a time, there was a poor woman who gave birth to a little boy. When the midwife held up the baby, she saw that his head was covered in a sticky, stinky pouch known as a corn. A corn is a sack of liquid a baby swims about in in the womb. This one had popped and wrapped itself over the baby's head. In those days, people celebrated a baby born with a call because to them it meant one thing, very good luck. The midwife told the poor woman that this was a sign that her fortunes had changed and that her son would marry the king's daughter in his 14th year and one day be king. Although how she knew this, we will never know. It seemed as though the baby had a blessed future but there was one big problem. The king. The king was one of those very horrible men who hates to see people happy. He loved to hear of people's misfortunes. And his favourite thing was to go into town disguised as a washerwoman and listen to the gossip around the coppers. Early one morning, the king had snuck into the village wash house. There he overheard that a boy had been born who would marry the royal princess and one day be king. That baby will be dead before the day is out. You see, he wanted to be king forever. No one can be king forever. And so, my dears, he found the house where the baby was born, and he leaned in through the window with his kindest smile, like a crocodile peeking out of the water. Dear poor woman, how bare and cold your house is, how snug and rosy is my own. Why don't you give your child to me? I will give him a better life. I will feed him chocolate pie and toasted crumpets and give him the warmest blankets and the loveliest baths. At first, the poor woman was not sure what to say. But then the king offered her a giant bar of gold. And she decided the chance of a better life must have already begun. So she placed her baby in the laundry basket, never knowing the washerwoman was really the wicked king. The king took the basket down to the market square, where there was a deep well that flowed beneath the town. Oh dear, I am a little tired. I think I'll just stop and take a rest by this well. Isn't that right, you little devil, you? Now, I know what you need. A little sing-song, hmm? Now, what shall it be? Ah, I know the very one. Rock my baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Oh, goodness me, my poor baby has fallen down the well. Whatever should I do? Perhaps I should call for help. But then it's awfully early and I wouldn't want to wake anyone up. Oh, silly me, I suppose I've well and truly done it now. Oh, well, all's well that ends well, I suppose. <laughs> 
and the despicable old stinker just walked off, leaving the beautiful baby to drown. But ask yourself this, where does the water in a well come from? And why does it never run out? You see, the water in a well is not standing still. It is moving, flowing. It comes in through a hole at one side and flows out again at the other. And at the bottom of this well, unknown to the wicked king, the basket had floated like a little raft. Not a drop of water had leaked inside, and the baby was fast asleep, dreaming a dream of dancing light. The basket bobbed around against the sides of the well until it went through the hole in one side where the water flows away, and the baby began to sail away like the tiniest little sailor on all the seven Through dark and echoey tunnels he floated until he came to the village wall where the stream met the main river. passing beneath the ancient walls of the castle, where the king had just ordered himself a hearty breakfast. It would be many years before the baby would see these walls again. On and on he floated until he came to the wild marshlands where the bullfrogs croak and the herons fish and all the time the baby was dreaming of soft kisses and warm grew high in the sky, with the castle and the village long behind, the basket flowed at last into the stream of the old miller and his wife. Now, the miller and his wife had no children of their own, and they jumped for joy and thanked the heavens for the gift they had been sent. They took good care.
care of the foundling. They taught him the ways of the forest, the importance of friendship, and the joy of story. And you know, they must have done a good job because he grew into a loving, kind, and generous young man. And they all lived happily ever after. Until one terrible stormy night, the miller opened the door of his house to find the king standing before him, drenched from head to foot. Come in, sire, said the miller, bowing low. Let us warm you by the fire. The king had forgotten all about the baby he had drowned. He was on a journey to declare war upon his enemies. But the mountain path had collapsed under the weight of his jewelled coat. The horses and the footmen had disappeared, screaming into the mist below. The king had jumped clear. But now his velvet cloak and his calfskin slippers were coated with slime. And an ugly old crow had pooed on his head. And so, he found himself at the old mill house. Our boy will be happy to mend your shoes, sir, and your hair and clothes will soon wash with a bit of hot water. Ah, you have a son, do you? Never wanted one myself. Smelly things, sons. I have a daughter, as you know, whose graces are beyond all reckoning. Oh, He's not our son, sir, though we think of him as such. No, he arrived, by the grace of God, in a laundry basket. Must have been, oh, 14 years ago now. The king realised this boy was none, other than the, the, was none other than the baby he had drowned, come back to life. And thinking fast, he said, I do not think I will be seen in a pair of mended shoes and your water is bound to be infected. I am taking a horse to go and buy new clothes from a merchant. In the meantime, your lucky lad will deliver a letter to my wife, the queen. And in return, I will give you a silver penny. Now, the miller and his wife did not care much for pennies. And they certainly didn't want their darling boy to head off into the storm. But they knew if they refused, the king would hang them. And so, with the letter in his pocket, the boy set off into the storm. But the words of the letter were written with the most wicked intentions. Pay attention, wife. This letter is important. The young man carrying it is a criminal and has asked his king, that's me, to pass judgment upon him. As soon as he arrives, he is to be taken to the dungeon, stretched and then put to death and buried under the rose beds. I order this to be done before I return. The lad, of course, knew none of this. He was on an adventure. And the storm had blown away. But he had never been on an adventure before. And it wasn't long before he was hopelessly and utterly with the dark sounds of the forest all about him. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, how did I get so lost? I can't find the path anywhere. And, oh, hang on, I can smell a wood fire. And, oh, and there's a window. Oh, oh, in the middle of a forest too. Oh, I can't believe my luck. The boy walked up to the door of the cottage. He turned the handle 
and he peeked inside. And there sat an old woman rocking by the fireside. He took me here and he took me there, and sailor boy took me everywhere. Oh, gracious, oh, heavens to Betsy, child, jeez, Louise. Oh, if you never heard a knocking, oh, oh, I thought you was a very reaper. Oh, my heart, oh, oh, my heart, oh. Oh, where are you coming from, child? And where are you going? Um, I'm from the mill, and I'm to deliver a letter to the Queen, but I've lost my way in this forest, and I was hoping to spend the night here. Oh, you poor thing. I'm afraid you've stumbled right into a robber's den. If my two boys come home and find you here, they'll kill you. I'm afraid I won't be able to stop them. They've buried my rolling pin. Oh, I'm sure they won't do anything to hurt me, Mum. I've never done anything to hurt them. Oh, well, suit yourself, dearie. But don't come crying to me if you wake up dead. Disagreed, the boy curled up by the fireside and settled into a strange dream in which he was jousting knights with only a rolling pin. But then, in the deep, dark hours, known as the middle of the night, I've heard the robbing someone blind, but there was no need to take his white stick. Well, he said his name was Peter. What's that got to do with it? I'm only robbing Peter to pay Paul. Come here, boy! There's a young man asleep over here, and I don't want him disturbed. He's just an innocent boy lost in the woods and I've let him stay here out of the goodness of my heart. Oh, skinny little wretch, isn't he? I don't look like he's gonna have much to steal. If we chased him through the woods screaming, he'd soon lead us to his home. Oh, he's got a letter in his hand. Look. Ooh. It's for the Queen. Oh, blimey, they're gonna kill him the minute he hands it over. I don't know what this country is coming to, brother. Well, I'll know a good story when I see one. And I think it's time this story took an interesting twist. <laughs> and so the robber sat hunched over his desk, rewriting the letter by candlelight, taking care to copy the king's handwriting. No, no, let me see. Uh, all right. Uh, a majestic queen, I am nothing without you. As soon as the young man arrives with this letter, I beg you to announce to our daughter that I have found her a husband. <laughs> she and this wonderful young man are to be married straight away. Do not wait for me to a return. Uh, also, uh, please ask my tailor to give my clothes away to the poor and fashion me a new wardrobe of the brightest pink lace. <laughs> oh, that's good, that. Yeah. And so the next morning, after a lovely breakfast of toasted cheese, the lucky lad was set on the right path and received at last into the magnificent splendour of the royal court. <laughs> the queen was delighted that her husband had had a change of heart and wasted no time in making preparations for the most wonderful wedding in all of Christendom. She had dreamed of this day for many years and delighted in the ordering of the roses, the sumptuous dress, the enormous cake, and the very romantic string quartet, all in honour of her daughter. The boy and the princess were a little shy when they first met. But he was courteous and kind, and 
and she thought that he was very cute indeed. She was different to how he imagined a princess, but still his heart was stolen. She had been raised differently by her mother than her father, and she was a little cracker. They were married with full pomp in the chapel of love. Several people commented on how gorgeous they both looked. And they both lived happily ever after. Until 300 pairs of pink lacy socks? What do you take me for? I'll have that boy strung from the rafters. What do I pay that good for nothing executioner for, I ask you? Certainly not to be a wedding photographer, that's for sure. Send for the boy, bring him to me, and make sure he is alone. The king stood on the great north tower, surveying his vast kingdom and the lands beyond. So, the commoner tried to outwit his king. You should be hanged for treachery. But I did as you bid me, sire. I delivered the letter. Oh, please, sir, I'm glad to be able to thank you at last. You may have the queen wrapped around your little finger boy, but not me. If you ever wish to see my daughter again, you must first go on a quest of my choosing. A dangerous one. Well... Yes, sire. I'll be glad to prove my worth. Yes, yes. The task is plain and simple. Beyond the horizon lies a gateway to hell. You must bring me three of the devil's golden hairs, no less. And don't think I'll settle for any old Goldilocks. The devil's hair can illuminate the deepest, darkest dungeon. Fail to retrieve them and never show your face here again on pain of death. And think yourself lucky I don't murder you here and now. Oh, thank you, sire. You do me a great honour. And with a bow, the boy left to say farewell. He left the castle with nothing but the clothes on his back and with the king hoping he was rid of the boy forever for no one has ever returned from hell alive. After a day or two's walking, the lucky lad arrived at the walled city of good vintage where a watchman leaned out over the gate and called in the fashion of the time. What is your trade and what do you know? I am a miller's boy and a prince of the realm and I know everything. Everything? Crikey, you're a bit full of yourself, aren't you? What I mean, sir, is that I know nothing and, well, the world has all the answers should you only ask the questions. Ooh, hark at you! Well, see if you can get your head around this one. Why has the fountain in our market square that has always flowed with wine suddenly run dry, eh? Get your head around that and you will be remembered in this city forever. I'll find out for you. Just wait till I return. The lad continued through green pastures. Soon he observed the vineyards had turned to orchards. And on the road ahead, he saw the beautiful town of 
Cape Russet and the famous gate of gilded leaves. What's your trade and what do you know? I'm a miller's boy and a prince of the realm and I know everything. Ah, you mean that you know nothing and the world has all the answers should you only ask the questions. Am I right? I knew you were a good egg when I saw you whistling to yourself in the distance. As it happens, there's a question we've been asking the world lately and no one seems to have come up with an answer. I'll find the answer for you, but you'll have to wait till I return to hear it. Okie dokie. Why does a tree in our town that has grown golden apples for centuries suddenly no longer even grow leaves? Find an answer to that and the town of Cape Russet will be forever at your service. Fare thee well! The lad spent the night in a lonely shrine. began to rise, huge and magical. He could see a red glow on the horizon where the mouth of hell lay open. I will need all my wits about me, he thought, and he settled into an uneasy sleep. The next morning, the lad reached a wide river with no bridge to be seen. The air was full of frightening magic and the mists hid malignant shapes. The boy stood on the banks of the river where he watched and he waited. He waited and he watched until at last the mist Parted, and there appeared the spectre of an ancient ferryman. boy and a prince of the realm and I know everything. Good boy, clever as a fox, that's the spirit. But some things even the world will not answer. I often ask a riddle, but for you I have waited a long time and have reserved special question. I will be pleased to answer it, if only you will ferry me across the river and back. The pleasure is all mine. My question then is this, why have I had to row back and forth across this river for always with no one to relieve me? The 
answer to this would be my greatest joy. And so we go. And with that, the lad plunged into hell. The subterranean corridors were decorated rather classically, if a little distasteful. dry oven and all the time the lad could hear a click, click, clicking noise and he imagined the devil sharpening the prongs of his frightful fork. constricted in fear. Come in! Sorry about the bell, love. We've been meaning to get that fixed. Are, are you the devil? Devil's not at home at the minute, love. I'm his grandmother. You just head straight on down to the bottom floor and follow signs for the lake of fire. Oh, well, thank you, but I'm only here on business. Um, pardon me for troubling you, but would the devil mind giving me of his golden hairs. Well, that's asking rather a lot, young man. If the devil gets home and finds you in his living room, it's going to get very hot under your collar. I'd run along home while you've still got the chance. Oh, well, thank you, but I can't return without the hairs because the king of the lands where I live, he will part me from my love forever. I'll never see her again. Oh, please, love. Please, help me get three golden hairs from the devil. <gasps> what a frightful man that king sounds. He'll have his bottom spanked with a red hot spade one of these days, I'll tell you. Well, perhaps I can help you with a little incantation I know called <clears throat> a telescopium, a harmonoptera. Now, let me see, how does this go? Oh, okay. 
Oh, great spirit to bell. Help me, help me with this spell. I'll shrink and shrivel. Don't be seen. Build a mountain for thy queen. Now the world is very small. Seize an acorn. Make a gall. Crown with honeydew thy head. Wingless wasp of burnished feathers. There you go, my pet. How do you feel? Fine, thanks. A bit leggy, but I feel very strong and I don't mind the hot air so much. You can stay inside the folds of my skirt, pet. You'll be safe there. The ant sat inside the folds of the grandmother's skirt where he listened to the click, click, click of her knitting needles. His antenna twitched around all the time and he found he could taste the air like a ripe cheese and, and smell colours and he suddenly wanted to do his quest all in one go without any rest at all. Oh, thank you, Mum. You're very kind to me. But I have one more favour to ask. I need to know the answer to three questions. Do you think I could ask you then? Oh, it's no good asking me, love. I ain't been outside for thousands of years. But the devil, he knows all sorts. And I'll ask the questions for you. Oh, thank you. I need to know why a fountain that has always flowed with wine has suddenly run dry. Why a tree that has grown golden fruit for centuries suddenly doesn't even grow leaves. And why the ferryman at the gates of hell has to row back and forth with no one to relieve him. Oh, those are difficult questions. But I'll do my best to see what I can find out. So listen carefully when I pluck the hairs from his head. Evening fell and the devil entered the room after a day of winning souls with his dice. I tell you, Grandmother, these sinners aren't what they used to be. Bunch of sissies, all worried what their wives will say, or whether they'll still get to heaven or not. Wasn't like that in the old days. Would have swapped their souls for a pound of butter back then. What's that foul smell, Grandmother? It smells like human flesh. Have you put a kiddie crumble in the oven? There's nothing in the oven, you silly devil. Why don't you come in and take the weight off your feet instead of hanging around in doorways nattering on about human flesh? You've always got the smell of human flesh in your nose. It's part of the devil's job description. Now, you just lie back with your head in my lap and I'll pick the lights out of your hair. Oh. That's lovely, Grandmother. Oh, sing a song, Grandmother. And so she did. Alas, the monster, she does me wrong to drown me so discourteously. For I have wandered alone too long to be dragged beneath your waters green. Green teeth are with your delight, green the teeth of my predator. Green my lungs as I breathed my last hope of my journey, green teeth. Oh, it wasn't me, mummy. Oh, the... oh, what the blaze is you doing, woman? You're picking lice, not plucking a chicken. Oh, oh, 
sorry, Mark, dearest. I must have drifted off and grabbed your hair. I was having a dream. Such a troubling, strange dream. Of what, for heaven's sake? Oh, I dreamt there was a fountain at the centre of a city that flowed with wine. And then all of a sudden it just dried up completely. What on earth could it mean? Oh, you must have been having a vision. The citizens of Good Vintage are such drunken layabouts, they've forgotten their history and not even bothered to look beneath the fountain. You see, it is not just a fountain, no, no. It is the spire of an ancient castle whose master is a giant toad named Lord Natterjack. If the fountain is to flow, they must kill the toad. But it will no doubt be centuries before they work it out. So put it from your mind and sing to me again. Of course, my dear. Now you just lie back, close your eyes and relax. My bones you broke and you spiked my heart Oh why did you so extinguish me That I decay by the sheen you sought With my carcass for her livery Green teeth are oh, your delight Green the teeth of my predator Green my lungs as I breathe my last oh, my Jenny Green tea. Oh, I swear Mr. Dog ate it. Oh, oh not you again. What the blazes is wrong with you today? Are you looking for a slap across the chops? Oh, I'm sorry, my dear. I must have drifted off again. I was having another dream. An even stranger one. This time, I was looking down on the rooftops of a town. Everyone was fussing around this grand old tree. They were afraid because the tree used to grow golden apples. But now it was leafless, even when the other trees was thick with leaves. What on earth could it mean? Oh, that tree. That is no dream, grandmother. The tree of golden apples has made the town of Cape Russet rich for centuries. But they have a much simpler problem on their hands. They must stop the mouse that is gnawing at the apple tree's roots. If they don't stop the mouse soon, the tree will wither and die. Now, Grandmother, are you going to stay awake and pick those lice? Of course, my dear. I'm feeling more awake now. I'll sit up a bit and finish my song. So you lie back and close your eyes. I have been butchered by your fair hand amongst the lilies my blood you craved. I did both wage and my life and land as I sank into your watery grave. Green teeth are oh, your delight, green the teeth of my predator, green my lungs as I breathed my last, oh but my Jenny green. Ah, there's a spider in my bed! Oh, oh, not you again! I ought to kick you around the room till your bottom bleeds! Oh, what on earth were you dreaming about this time? Oh, my dear, I'm sorry. It was such a sad, sad dream. About the ferryman who crosses the river at the gates of hell. Well, he kept asking me and asking me, Why is this happening to me? Why must I row back? and forth with no one to relieve me. 
Well, he'll just have to work it out for himself, won't he? There's always been a ferryman, and the answer's always been the same. And there always must be a ferryman. <sighs> he is the twelfth successor of the brute's enchantment made by the princelings of just ruin. If the ferryman wishes to be free, then the passenger must offer to take the paddle. Now, pour me a nightcap and get your bed. I'll not wake to an empty breakfast table. And so the devil took a brandy to bed and finally began to dream himself. When the old lady saw it was safe, she took the ant from the folds of her skirt and shouted the words to break the spell. Oh, great spirits of hell, return him to the shape he knows full well. Lord, prime. Oh, oh there you go, my pet good as new. Now remember, walk on two legs, it'll be much easier. And don't worry if your taste buds feel a little numb. Now. These are the hairs you were looking for. They'll not burn you in this lantern. And I hope you remember the answers to the questions, because I certainly don't. I remember, uh, kill the toad and the wine will flow, catch the mouse gnawing at the apple tree's roots and it will bear golden fruit, and let the passenger take the paddle and the ferryman will be free. Oh, thank you, Mum. How will I ever repay you? Oh, think nothing of it. You remind me so much of a little imp I once knew. It's all I could do not to clear out that pigsty of a bedroom and keep you for my own. Now, here's the hairs. Off you go. Thank you, Mum. Thank you. The lad emerged into the cool night air and he thought to himself, I've been to hell and back. I really am a lucky lad. Now, home I go. I hope my home will be with the princess, but this story isn't over yet. I'm curious, ferryman. Why don't you put your paddle down and walk away? Oh, believe me, I have tried, but all paths lead back to the river. The paddle is unbreakable. The boat is unsinkable. And so I have shouldered my burden, hoping one day to be rewarded. And how did you end up performing this job? Ah, now that is a question. But the answer escapes me. Was there another? Yes, I think there was. A friend, perhaps. I remember his face. I recall him rowing, but now he is gone, and I do all the work myself. I think he will never return. Sir, you will never be rewarded for your duty, for it is your prison. The man you remember was no friend, though you were kind to share his burden. The answer to your question is this. The next person who wishes to cross with you must offer to take the paddle. If you let them, then they will become the ferryman. But please, sir, if they are kind as you were, do not run straight away to rejoice in your freedom. Tell them what I have just told you, so they do not suffer as you have. Thank you, ferryman. We are at the other shore. May the next passenger bring you your freedom. And now, the lucky lad quickened his pace to meet his princess. He was met 
at the town of Cape Brassic with great excitement. And for finding the answer to their question, he was rewarded with two donkeys laden with gold. The mouse was lured out of the ground by the mayor's pet lady mouse and the two mice fell very much in love. And without teeth gnawing at the roots of the tree, it burst into lusher life with sweeter apples than ever before. And the cider was bloody fantastic. The boy left the city of good vintage with another two donkeys laden with gold. And for finding the answer to their question, he has ever been remembered in their history books as the Knight of the Brimming Goblet. I'm afraid to tell you that poor old Lord Natterjack, the giant wine-stealing toad, did not fare as well as the fortunate mouse of Cape Russet. He was hunted and stalked through badger holes and forests and caves until eventually he ended up as the centrepiece of a city banquet, as Toad in the Hole. The citizens filled their glasses from the now flowing fountain of wine and raised a toast to that most noble of knights, the knight of the brimming goblet. One dark night, the king was sent news. The boy had been seen a day's walk from the castle. He mounted a horse and galloped furiously ahead on the road to meet him. He had expected the boy to be dead, but instead he had grown taller and nobler. I present you with the three golden hairs of the devil, my liege. They have lit my way in the darkness, and now my quest has brought me home. I have no need of luminous hairs, you fool, and you may keep my daughter. She's not stopped snivelling for over a year now. If you want to impress me, boy, you can tell me where you got the gold that your donkeys are carrying. That's a sizeable fortune. Oh, this, this is nothing. I was ferried across a river, and that's where I found it. On the other side of the river, the shore is made of gold. You could build a city out of it, no problem. I'm sure the ferryman would be glad to grant you passage. And so the king continued over the mountains while the boy took the final road home. When the king arrived at the river, the ferryman saw straight away he was too miserable and selfish to help offer to paddle, so this is what he said. I am an old man, sir. I have only recently taken a passenger. My arms are too weak to paddle today. Perhaps you could give me a week or two to get my strength back. Give me the paddle, you wretched old loon. I will cross by myself. And when I get back, I will have your head chopped off for your laziness. But the ferryman did not wait around for his head to be chopped off. For he was free. Oh, at last. Halfway across the river, the king had already forgotten ever meeting the ferryman and that he was ever a king at all. Fairy magic is like that. And is he still?
ferrying people back and forth across the river. What do you mean? Of course he is. There is no one who will take the paddle of such a bad-mannered old misery gut. Back at the palace, the boy was met with great joy. Trumpets sounded and bells rang, and the three golden hairs were hoisted up to light the gates of the city. The lucky lad and the princess were finally reunited and wasted no time in making up for a year's lost kisses. The Queen was happy, as women often are when their husbands go away, and she ordered a wonderful celebration to last 30 days and 30 nights, and everyone in the kingdom was invited. The miller and his wife were guests of honour, and amazed they were to find their lost son a blossoming prince of the realm. When things had settled back to normal, or thereabouts, the miller and his son went fishing by the river, just as they used to. They talked of all that had passed. And in the silence that followed, the miller said to his son, How is it that a boy so young can have had such adventures. The lad thought for a while as the river carried on past him. Some people are just lucky, I guess. And from that day forth, I am glad to report, they really did live happily, happily, happily ever after.